Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores our behavior through a scientific lens. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We take a deep dive with researchers and authors to peel back the simple answers and to get to the more complex answers underlying some of the most important questions that we can ask. The questions about why we do what we do or what we say or why we think something. And sometimes we ask the question not about what we do, but instead about what we don't do. And today's episode is focused a lot on the underlying aspect of what happens when we decide not to do something or not to take action. Our guest today is the world-famous Max Bazerman. Max is the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and the co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's the author, co-author, or co-editor of 20 books and over 200 research articles and chapters. His awards include an honorary doctorate from the University of London and the, both the Distinguished Educator Award and the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Academy of Management. <laughs> Man, Amazing. that's crazy. Max is also recognized as one of the pioneers in behavioral science, bringing a key focus on decision-making as well as ethics to the field. And we were fortunate enough to have him back today for his second episode with us to talk about his latest book, Complicit, How We Enable the Unethical and How to Stop. Our conversation was rich with insight into how, too often, we can be complicit in unethical behavior, even when we are not doing anything wrong ourselves. Max points out that too often we stay silent when we should speak up, that we gloss over details when we should dig deeper, that we sometimes let things slide at the very moment that we should stand up and fight. Max brings a uh, light to this topic and to our world, a light that helps us see the world more clearly. And it's not just the light that he shines on others. He focuses that light on himself as well and explores his own past and how he was complicit in many things that he now regrets. So we hope that you find this conversation as interesting and amazingly insightful as we did. And if you do, please make sure that you share this with a friend or two or three on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> We think that it is an important discussion that needs to have more people included. We would ask also that you check out Behavioral Grooves on Twitter, where we're going to be posting some questions about being complicit and would love your thoughts on that matter. So with that, sit back with your Apple podcast in a great big pour of complicit brew and listen to our fascinating discussion with Max Bazerman. Max Bazerman, welcome to Behavioral Grooves again. Why, thank you. It's, I'm delighted to be back. I enjoyed my last visit with you and happy to be talking with you again. Thanks very much, Max. We, you know, so we're going to talk today about your new book, Complicit, How We Enable the Unethical and How to Stop. Uh, it's, it's monumental work. We're, we're grateful that you wrote it. Um, but let's start with the definition. What does it mean to be complicit? It means to be around somebody who's engaged in illegal or unethical behavior and to play a role either through action or inaction in allowing the wrongful behavior to occur. Yeah. When you were thinking about this book, what, what was the impetus uh, to write this book, particularly at this stage of your career? Well, quite honestly, if we go back to January 1st, 2021, this book wasn't even on my radar screen. Wow. <laughs> wow. That seems crazy. And you mentioned, you mentioned in your book that the, or that you, that this was the fastest book that you've ever written. So, yeah. So how does it get on your radar, radar screen? How does it become something, you know, that, that you want to dive into? So the coup happens on January 6th, 6, 2000, uh, 2021. And I was just stunned. And what I thought about is, the actions of so many people that allowed the events to develop to the point where the coup attempt at the Capitol was even possible. And I quickly then wrote probably 50 pages about Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and other people who stood by and allowed this authoritarian regime to develop 
so that the coup attempt was even possible. And of course, that took me back to the collaborators of the Nazis. And I wrote yep. maybe 30 pages on that. And then some of the wise people around me said, you know, Max, people don't actually look at it, look to you for um, a review of the Trump era or the Nazi era. They tend to think about you connected to business problems. And that, that critique led me to spend time looking at all the visible scandals that are in the newspaper, have books written about them or show up in miniseries. And um, Complicit is a review of stories that I'm sure the reader is familiar with, but retelling them from the perspective, not of the chief perpetrator of the wrongdoing, but all the people around the perpetrator who allow the wrongful behavior to develop. And I was just stunned by um, sort of realizing how much we all can do to keep wrongful behavior from occurring. But too often, we simply don't. And, and, and I reflect not only on the episodes we see in the press, but, but my own behavior and many uh, sort of lesser stories that I've been a part of where um, I wasn't engaged in what most people would think of wrongful, wrongful behavior, but I could have done more to stop that behavior from occurring. Yeah. Wow. Uh, there's, there's a lot there. And, we, and we've got some, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we want to get to um, in that. As I mentioned before, we actually started recording. I think that you're always thoughtful, brutally honest, even thought provoking. You know, your writing is 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 uh, always extremely engaging. But this book seems to manifest all that in just such tremendous abundance. It was January sixth that sort of huge of a bomb in you that it it really it was this enormous catalyst that sort of you know, uh, allowed you to just uh, really flay open, you know, you know, it's very emotional uh, writing. Yeah. So, um, so some of it's emotional and personal and other, uh, and other pieces are analytic about what I read in the newspaper. Mm. Um, and in the former category, you know, once I started working on the topic of complicit, originally I called it uh, profiles in complicity mm. and it became complicit over time. And once I started working on it, it, it's hard not to reflect on your own behavior. So, for example, there was um, one episode where, uh, you know, I'm a member of an honorary group called the Academy of Management Fellows. And every year we get, we get an a, uh, email allowing us to nominate zero or one new, new individual to be a fellow. And then the nominees are voted on through a well-specified process. And I've long known um, from the diversity and inclusion literature that when you try to identify one person, we do an insufficient search and underrepresented individuals often don't come to mind. Mm -hmm. that, that if you want to have an inclusive search, you, you need to search more broadly than think of the one individual who comes to mind. And when I looked at that organization, it was an organization that not many years ago primarily consisted of white males. Yeah. <laughs> and when even I had nominated people, um, I often thought about sort of somebody close to me. And unfortunately, you know, the way the business school professor world worked as of a number of years ago was a predominantly Caucasian group of individuals. So when I went with the first name that came to mind, perhaps a doctoral student who had worked with me 15 years ago and now was becoming a well-known person in the field, I thought of too many white people and I had nominated white people. And I think that that's what a lot of other fellows did. And when I brought this up and basically suggested to the organization that we had a problem, that we had a problem that many of us who consulted to, to other organizations would never recommend as a process. But we stood by and allowed us to have a process that wasn't sufficiently representative for many, many years. And when I brought it up, quite, quite honestly, the organization was happy to engage and to move toward a better system. There were a couple of people who liked the current system just fine, but the majority of people who voiced an opinion we're enthusiastic about moving in a better direction for a more inclusive organization. So just this idea of saying something, standing up for a better process, 
can be very, very powerful. And, and you know, I've heard so many other systems. I was um, talking to a friend of mine who was a retired executive from a well-known financial firm, and uh, he asked what I was working on, and, and I told him about my book, Complicit. And he told me almost the same story, where he was in a sort of an end-of-the-year new session, and they were reviewing a bunch of um, individuals in terms of their performance, and there was this one guy getting really nice comments, and in the back of his mind, he thought, but this guy is rumored to be harassing younger women on a regular basis. And finally, he decided to say, but what about the rumors about his harassment? And once he said that, everyone else in the rooms had other stories, oh, and yeah. it dramatically changed the discussion. And his willingness to speak up was key, and it, was, it wasn't a hard thing to do. But it took a, a, a little bit of courage, and I think it's courage that we all want to see in our organizations. And and as you know, there's a whole chapter in the book on um, the data fraud story that affected me dramatically in 2021. So I start this book January, so now, by late January, I start this book. And as you mentioned earlier in the discussion, I've never had a book come out of me so quickly. It was just so, yeah. it was so easy to write these stories and to identify the role of complicitors. And then in July, the Data Colada team, um, three well-known behavioral researchers who have a famous blog post, um, uh, basically notify five authors of a paper, of which I was the fifth author, that um, they have conclusive evidence that um, one of our studies is fraudulent. And um, when I looked at their evidence, I was very convinced that they were correct, that someone had made up some of this data. And um, I hadn't committed fraud. But as I sort of thought about my role in being an author of a fraudulent paper, um, I could just identify lots of times when I didn't do enough digging in to find the problem on my own. So I didn't commit the fraud. I, in fact, probably was the most critical of the five authors in asking questions. But when I raised questions about something that looked wrong and someone could give me a conceivably acceptable answer, I trusted my co-authors mm -hmm. and moved forward accordingly. And, you know, in retrospect, had I spent a half hour, maybe an hour, um, more carefully looking at the database, I think I would have discovered that, that there were too many things wrong with this database. So, uh, again, it's, it's not just the, the person provides fraudulent data that we need to be concerned with. We, we need to all be concerned about how we allow unethical behavior to develop. You talked about in, in that last kind of component, you talked about this idea of the person who was silent and thinking, oh, this person has these rumors about it, and then, you know, actually stating something. And you talk a lot in the book about the difference between omission and commission and this idea that, you know, we we understand complicit and kind of bad behavior when it's when it's commission, when we're actually doing something. But the the omission part, the staying silent part, the maybe just, you know, as you said, oh, I, I raised some questions, but did I raise enough questions in this? Did I did I go far enough? How do we understand our own role in that, particularly in, in those omission pieces, because sometimes it is just like you you ask a question or you stay silent because of all of the, the pressures that are on us from a social component, from a fitting in component, a don't want to rock the boat component. How do we do that easier? Is there anything that you you kind of picked up in the work on here? Terrific question, Kurt. Uh, so th thank you. Um, so first of all, there's terrific work in, in the, what's now often called the behavior economics literature on errors of omission versus commission. And we hold ourselves and we hold other people much more responsible for errors of commission than errors of omission. And I think that's a mistake. Part of what I want to do is correct that. I, I, I want to have readers think more about their errors of omission. And when we allow evil to happen, and we could have prevented it. We missed an opportunity to be a more ethical person. Now, undoubtedly, you're correct. There is sometimes risk 
in speaking up. Um, and in, you know, for somebody who is dependent on their salary, who is a sole breadwinner in their family, and speaking up might have dangers. But I'm kind of fascinated by the large number of people who are doing just fine in society, who have sort of financial cushions, um, have other opportunities, don't want to really be part of evil, but yet don't speak up. And, you know, so in, in writing this book, you know, part of what I take away from thinking about it for the last um, kind of year and a half is I don't want to be a complicitor. So when I look back on my life, I want to be someone who did the right thing. And so I, so for me, I almost feel a commitment to not be complicit in the ways that I have been in the past. And when there's potential wrong to speak up and to potentially deal with an awkward situation. So moving forward, I'm going to look at my databases more carefully and I'm going to do my best to explain that to my co-authors so that they don't feel offended when I say, can I look at the data, even though they have better empirical skills than I do. And there's little um, technical reason for me to be reviewing the work. I just want to know the data if my name's going to be on it. And, and, um, and if there's sexist or race behavior going on around me, I have a commitment to myself to speak up. And I think that a lot of readers are likely to develop a stronger commitment to speak up when they're aware of the potential negative effect of their errors of omission. I'm um, going back to, to the way you asked the question. Well, I, I, you did. The, the book absolutely spurred me to revisit my own childhood growing up in an Irish Catholic family when the sort of, I guess you might call it sort of quasi-religious uh, messages that went along with uh, the way religion was presented to me was there are sins of commission and sins of omission. And my mother was very clear about you can't just stand by when something bad is happening. You, you can't that that's not OK. That that's equally bad behavior. And the book, you know, reminded me of this in the most wonderful way. And I thought, you know, this is actually something that I I truly believe in. Yet it had sort of drifted from me. You know, wow. It, so do I owe your mother co-authorship? <laughs> no, 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 no. Win Houlihan would be very happy to 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 take that, uh, you know, but no, no, this is this is just uh, it, it's an important message. I guess my, my point is that it's such an important message. And I love the way that you're thinking about it as maybe the book can actually, you know, be the seed to bring this message to, to more people and remind them. Of, of where they want to be. Absolutely. And, and I don't mean to make the book me a bad person, but I think thinking about complicity allows me to think about how to be a better person moving forward. So my prior book, Better Not Perfect, and uh, Dolly Chug's books um, aren't about how to be perfect. They're about how to be better. And I think one path toward betterment is to find, to think about ways to be less complicit in the future. Yeah, Max, it reminded me of Philip Zimbardo's Heroic Imagination Project. I don't know if you're aware of that, but, you know, part of his kind of stuff as coming out of the, the prison experiment and saying there's a few bad apples, he said, but there's also those people that, that you know, stand up and they, they make the statement, they do the heroic thing, and it's not usually a big heroic thing. They're little things like you just said. They they make a statement when somebody is is maybe saying something racist and they they make the effort to go and do the different things. And I'm thinking that if we can kind of tap into that, I think that's one of the, the big things and I think your book helps to do that. But one of the things that you kind of really push in this in, in the book is this idea that we're too focused in on bad apples, that it's these bad apples that are doing this as opposed to the kind of general people around them that are that complicit aspect of it. Um, and there's two questions um, there, because I, I do think it's important to to not have that focus on on the bad apples as the only ways to do this. And you talked a little bit before we got on about this bounded ethicality that you you kind of are bringing in. So I'd lo love for you to kind of talk a little bit more about that. And then I want to follow up with another question, but let's let's hear that first. Sure. So let me give you my quick history of um, ethics teaching in business schools. So <laughs> up, up, until, up until 2001, 
ethics was a pretty rare topic in business schools and often taught by um, an occasional philosopher who somehow wandered into a business school. And then Enron happened and a bunch of other scandals and the world said to business schools, you need to be doing something about that. And over the last 20 years, we've seen business schools sort of take to the topic of ethics in a dramatic way. But the truth is that few of us had any ideas about how to stop the next Bernie Madoff or Elizabeth Holmes from coming into existence. And behavioral researchers switched to the world of bounded ethicality or the ways in which perfectly nice people might engage in bad behavior without their own awareness. And as this occurred, um, we moved away from the bad apples that the media focused on and focused on the regular folks around us. And our, the researchers kind of gave up on the bad apples because <laughs> we didn't have good answers. And I, I'm hoping that Complicit provides some good answers because the truth is that I don't know very much about how to stop the next Bernie Madoff from coming into existence. But I think I know a great deal about how to arm my students from being complicit and allowing the next Bernie Madoff to create the harmful events that they might otherwise create. So I want to create a world of professionals who feel an obligation to speak up, to create organizational leaders who sort of tell their workforce that it's their job to speak up so that we view complicity in the role and the harmful role that it actually has. And in doing so, we eliminate our complicity. And when we eliminate complicity, the wrongdoers aren't going to want to engage in their harmful behavior because they won't be able to get away with it. So do you think that it's, is it more likely that we're going to notice unethical behavior as it sort of creeps in slowly, or are we less likely to notice it? I think that we have lots of evidence that we notice things to a lesser degree if they occur slowly over time. So, you know, it's um, I, I, I often think about episodes like Enron, yeah. sort of did Arthur Anderson simply sort of not notice this egregious behavior that popped out of nowhere? Or did it happen slowly over time where Enron's behavior became more and more unethical over the years? And Arthur Anderson didn't want to admit that we shouldn't have said OK last year. And they basically escalated their way into a process of being complicit with the corrupt behavior that was going on at Enron. Yeah. Yeah. It, that slippery slope, which is always a interesting concept. But I think that there's some real evidence that that it happens, particularly in this type of, of scenario, as we, we talk about that. Going back to those bad apples and understanding how those bad apples kind of play in or don't play in, right? This idea that we we can't necessarily stop the next Bernie Madoff, but hopefully we can build that uh, system around him that won't let that be go unnoticed or without kind of some pushback on that. My question, though, and I think it goes back to what you started at the very beginning of the impetus for this, this January 6th, you know, the the insurrection and the things around it. Do you think there's anything about the role that bad apples play, um, particularly high profile bad apples in how people think about behavior and maybe allowing it to to get worse and worse? In other words, do we somehow legitimize horrible behavior and make our complicitness easier or more acceptable as as we go? Because we have high profile people out there doing relatively horrible things and we're not holding them necessarily accountable. And so it becomes maybe it's OK. People start to view that. I think there's no doubt um, about the accuracy of of what you've just suggested. I think that you're highlighting a, a kind of a critical issue. Um, I think that whether we look at Wall Street behavior or congressional behavior um, or the behavior um, of authoritarian regimes who change the norm in society and make um, what would have been seen as unacceptable white supremacy in the past seem more acceptable to too many people. Um, so I think that the tone set at the top is absolutely critical. I think that leaders do have a special role in creating the norms that govern society, the society around us. And I, and I would hope that our political leaders would do a good job of conveying to the public 
that they don't want citizens to accept unethical behavior, either that destroys democracy or is clearly racist in a variety of ways. Yeah, it, it, it reminded me of the Bobo doll experiments by Albert Bandura in the 1960s. Like, it just, here it is again. You know, here we are facing the, the exact same world, um, it, it, but playing out on a bigger stage, you know, in, in, in the political world. Absolutely. So, I mean, so obviously we've had racist behavior that's been studied for a very long period of time. But for so many of us, we thought that we were constantly improving on social issues over time. And then uh, we ran into some setbacks. And, and the question is how to change the norm and get back on the path toward justice and becoming the people that we would like to be rather than a lesser form of human existence. In that case, though, does, does it require us to, again, as, as we think about the leaders that you, that you just talked about, both within, you know, business, within politics, all of those who have potentially led us down this alternative road that we don't like to be on, do we, is it, is it just a matter of getting the right people in place now to take us back to that? Or is there something that we have to be able to do to hold those those others accountable? And and that, that I think it's a big question. I don't know if you have an answer for that. But, you know, there's part of this, which is, is it just two competing camps, good versus evil in one way? Or is it really just saying we have to somehow create that negative consequences for that, you know, the, the, the bad behavior such that it kind of makes them rethink about how they're doing that. I don't know if that's a fair question or not. No, I think you. it's a fair question. I, I think it's a little bit of a chicken egg question. Do leaders need to motivate employ, uh, sort of uh, others to care about unethical behavior or do, or do the citizens or the employees need to demand ethical behavior from the leaders? And, and the answer is both. But, but I, your question also highlights the fact that it's not just the leaders who need to do something. All of us can do something. And to the extent that we become, if we move toward a more just set of behaviors and reduce our own complicity, we're more likely to get the leaders that we actually want. Well, you know, you brought up the George Floyd uh, scenario in the book, and uh, which was near and dear to Kurtz in my heart because we we're both living in Minneapolis at the time. And it wasn't, uh, you know, I uh, acknowledge and want to praise the authorities that they didn't just charge Derek Chauvin that they actually also charged the the other officers that were there. And, you know, if it, it, honestly, if it wasn't for a very brave young woman standing there and recording this whole thing, things might have gone terribly different. But do you feel like could that be seen as sort of a maybe we're moving a little bit more in that direction? Like, like you know, kind of getting back to your 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 issue of it's both the citizens and the leaders. You know, everybody needs to be moving forward. Is there is, is there some hope maybe? Of course, there's hope. Um, I, I hope my book comes across as hopeful, um, <laughs> rather than accepting um, the complicit world that we're currently in. Um, but you, you also raise you, you move from ethics to, to legality, and you and anyone listening should be aware that I'm not a lawyer, so don't get your legal advice from me. Um, <laughs> and there were officers held accountable for their complicity. And uh, more recently, on the Theranos story, not only was um, Elizabeth Holmes found guilty, but Sonny Balwani, who was the president and the romantic partner of uh, Elizabeth Holmes, um, was also found guilty of multiple frauds. Mm -hmm. um, so in some cases, complicitors are engaged in illegal behavior um, and society is holding them accountable. But there are also lots of other behaviors that, from my sort of unprofessional, uh, from my non, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but from my impression, there's lots of other unethical behaviors, uh, complicit behaviors that aren't technically illegal, mm. but we still want to root them out so that the illegal behavior doesn't, isn't allowed to happen. Well, you mentioned in, in the book about Bernie Madoff and the customers that some of them knew that those reports were wrong but did nothing, right? And again, that probably falls into, is that illegal? I, I don't know. And again, neither Tim or I are lawyers on this, but that probably doesn't fall into that illegal. 
but it's definitely an unethical component, right? It is something that we should have those people in retrospect, if you think of them as being good people, they should have raised some concerns about that. So where is it that we can be more helpful in making that a reality? Where where are the places that we as the citizen group that you talk about can really make that happen so that we hold those uh, people in power more accountable to, to the, the you know, bad behavior that they're eliciting? So, so we've been talking about it, but one answer is speaking up, even if there's some risk involved. Um, to look at the systems that exist in our organizations and ask whether we have the right systems in place. So in the story I told you earlier about the Academy of Management Fellows, um, I was arguing that the nomination process was a bad system. And we stood by and allowed that bad system to exist for an extended period of time. But we can look at lots of systems in our society. So um, one of the systems that I'm very critical of is what's called independent auditing, which um, I've tried to document isn't remotely independent. So <laughs> in, the, in the U.S. and most developed economies, corporations have to be audited by a quote-unquote independent auditor. Um, but the problem is the way Congress has written those rules those auditors are hired by the people they audit. They're rehired by the people that they audit. The auditors are often selling other services that are even more profitable. And, and the people doing the audits are often taking jobs with the people that they're auditing. This is a lot like asking a parent, how smart is your child? It's just not reasonable <laughs> to expect you're going to get a reasonable answer. And so for me, um, I find it fraudulent to use the term independent in, in the term independent auditing, because the one thing we know that that audit is not is independent. So if we want to be able to trust the books of the firm, we need to completely rethink what that system looks like. And we can say the same thing for credit rating agencies and many other sort of structures that we create where yeah. we're not getting the oversight that we should be looking for. So not only do I want all of us to provide more oversight and speak up more, but particularly those institutions that are supposed to protect us by providing oversight. I want them to be more proactive. If, if we go back to Elizabeth Holmes, I want that board of directors to be accountable for actually doing their job and providing oversight over Elizabeth Holmes instead of just showing up in a boardroom and um, listen, listening to her as if she's some new guru um, suppressing all of their um, uh, sort of reasoning skills in the process. So to what degree uh, is there an element of this, uh, of of our behaviors, the complicit behaviors that sort of comes from, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm and I'm not an expert in anthropological kind of psychology, but it feels like over time we've developed a way to cope and that this seems sort of natural for us to allow the, the bad behavior to, to happen. You know, that to some degree, it's like it's that that sin of omission almost feels like, well, it's OK, because because my hand wasn't on, you know, the, the trolley car thing. You know, my I didn't push the guy over the over the, the, the rail to stop the trolley. So that wasn't me. You know, I think that that sounds exactly right. I think a lot of us grew up in an educational system where you wanted to have the goods before you raised your hand in class. Mm -hmm. Um Sort of, it, it, it'd be nice to speak up and say something smart, but the last thing you want to do is raise your hand and say something that ends up being criticized or is wrong. And yeah. and I think that we create too much, we've created too much fear in speaking up when in fact there's so much value in avoiding harm um, in that process. So um, we'd like all of us to think about whether or not we should be speaking up more often and avoiding errors of omission, as we were discussing earlier. I, love that. I think it's really interesting the way that you talk about the systems that we have in place, particularly within our organizations, where I think most of us and most of our listeners probably feel like we we can maybe have an impact on that. And it is those systems that are in place that are often are invisible to us, though, right? We It's the status quo. It's this is the way we've always done it. Um, and so is there is there a way, uh, again, to kind of help us take a critical eye to some of those systems, anything that you can think of to to help us 
explore. Like you said, when you were talking about the the data piece, right? You you raised some questions, but then you got a response that said, "Oh no, it's okay." And that was perfectly acceptable because that's the way that you guys had always kind of done it. Well, and, and you trusted those people. You, you trust those, the, your yeah. colleagues, right? So, yeah. I mean, there, there's a, you had a relationship with them. So trust is, is, is one of the profiles that I identify in the book. And, that, and trust is great. On yeah. the other hand, do we have a professional responsibility to also check? Okay. And I, I can't say that I was a big fan of the trust, but verify. But maybe that's what I'm. <laughs> you know, maybe that's what I'm suggesting. That I, I could both trust and also feel an obligation to make sure things are okay. But to the broader question that that Kurt was asking, sort of, how do we think about our systems? I would say, take a look in your organization and identify what things simply don't make sense. Mm-hmm. So we all know that they don't make sense. But that's the way it's always been done. And my reaction is just because it's always been done that way doesn't make, it doesn't make it make sense in 2022 to operate that way. So we have an awful lot of procedures that may have made sense in 1990 and we simply have perpetuated those processes. And now it makes sense to look at it in kind of a different way. It's interesting. I've recently joined a a, a new company. Uh, not not a, okay. So I, I took a new job uh, at at a company that's been around for a hundred years, and I find myself asking my colleagues, "Well, how? What's the way that we do things? You know, I I, I want to I want to fit in. I want to be culturally relevant. I don't want to be the standout." And I have actually heard my own voice say, "Well." How do we actually get that done? And uh, and of course, some of it's process and procedure, but some of it is this informal but very culturally relevant. You know, this is what's acceptable and this is what's not. And uh, and, and I think that that sounds terrific. So you're asking questions about sort of does this procedure make sense? Yeah. I would say also talk to people who you're comfortable with because oftentimes when something's wrong. Multiple people kind of have a hint about it and yeah. nobody wants to speak up alone. But when four of us all realize we've noticed the same problem, that may give us all courage to move forward. So having the social verification that it's not just me who sees something out of whack, but there's a group of us who understand this um, may be a powerful element in um, creating a, a pathway toward improvement. And to some degree, was that was that also present in your uh, in the the data collada issue with the with the fraudulent data uh, on your on your paper that that as uh, I mean was there sort of the sense of okay actually we do kind of agree that there's a problem here or at least the majority of you agreed. So it's, it's a complicated story. So um, so sorry, and 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 yeah, uh, but, but I'll do my best to try to give a, a short answer. So we published this paper in 2011, and there were five of us. And then a number of years later, I'm working with two other colleagues. Uh, instead of looking at the impact of signing before rather than after signing a document, I'm looking at how to induce honesty online, mm-hmm. and we're trying to simply replicate what's going on in the 2011 paper. And in that process, we basically find that the 2011 paper doesn't replicate. Now, failure to replicate doesn't imply data fraud. uh, There's a variety of reasons why a project might not replicate, but we wanted to move forward. We invited the original authors into the new, new project that was published in 2017 on the failure to replicate. And in that context, there was a lot of tension over how convinced we were that the original finding did not replicate. And I was certainly on the side of believing it did not replicate. So there was some tension there. But the sort of evidence of data fraud in a more explicit way, that's really that really comes from the data collada theory. So I, to be honest, I never suspected fraud, fraud in the process. I, just, I, I had a variety of other hypotheses about how we publish data that didn't replicate. Um, but it was um, the independent work of, uh, uh, of Simonson, Nelson, and Simmons that really brought forward the fact that um, the data had been fraudulent. It is interesting, too, with Data Clada, because they've done this with other groups and not necessarily fraudulent, but just looking at data issues in a variety of different pieces. And one of the things that they state is that, you know, 
this is this is a side project for them. They, they, you know, this is just a project of passion, basically. And what I think one of the things that they're, they 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 kind of really push is we shouldn't have to be doing this. This is something that this the 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 whole process of having the the check being done in a really unsystematic manner by just a group of people that are out there. So it kind of goes back to maybe some of the systems that we have is the is the way that we do research and look at data in these issues. Because, again, you can look back. There have been not not that, as you said, replication isn't always because of data fraud. But you look back and there have been a number of fraudulent um, research studies that have caused some actually pretty serious harm when you look at the autism study and some of the other I forget who is the, the the person who is talking about all the food studies and how we eat and, again, making up data in different pieces. My long kind of diatribe here, uh, Max, basically just comes back to the point of the way that we do research and that the way that research gets kind of um, published. Is there something wrong in the way that system is set up and do we need to look at that system differently? Absolutely. And I think we are. So, so first of all, I'm a uh big fan of what's kind of viewed as the reform movement and the social sciences and the data collider team are, are, have clearly been leaders in pushing us toward reform. And, and when they published some of their early work about a decade or so ago, there was a lot of resistance where people yeah. wanted to defend the existing system. But I think that they're, they've provided so much compelling evidence that um, that the new generation is basically saying we want to do science in a different way. And there's there's new norms and there's new standards um, about posting your data online, um, m- making it clear who did w- what pieces of, of the work. We, we could just list lots of different data, uh, a lot of different reforms that more and more journals have sort of accepted as where we need to head. I, I would say we move too slowly but I think we've moved in the right direction and we're moving toward a new social science. And um, we should be grateful to all the reformers yeah. um, for pushing us against um, many people who just didn't see the magnitude of the problems that we had in the system. So we're getting better, but not perfect. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and, and that that reminds me, we talked to your dear friend, uh, Dolly Chug recently, and uh, we we told her that we'd be talking to you, uh, and she's oh you have to ask Max how does he do it how do you bring up how do you ma- match the world's issues with scholarship and yet you format it for such a general audience and you make things so clear and plain how do you do it so for all of our listeners can you just tell Dolly and and everyone else how do you write such high quality material. <laughs> Wow. Um, uh, so um, I'll let others uh, decide whether it's high quality material or not. Um, but um, despite the fact that my name is on the book and it's, it's the only name on the cover, um, if you take a look at the acknowledgments, um, you'll see that I'm surrounded by an amazing cast of characters. So um, so my pride, uh, my, my, my biggest source of pride in my academic career is being surrounded by um, a large number of spectacular doctoral students, and that includes Dolly Chug. And I clearly get so many of my ideas from these other scholars who push me and who are smarter than me and know more about data analysis than me. So I, I, I think I get ideas for, from lots of different people. Um, during COVID, I've been at, sort of rather than just attending seminars at Harvard, I attend seminars all over the world because it's so easy to, to zoom into seminars. So I'm constantly on the lookout for things that I should be kind of paying attention to. And, you know, Dolly's, you know, a key, a key figure in kind of moving ethics away from the way philosophers think of, a, of an ideal state. And, and encouraging us all to be better in a variety of ways. Most of the time, Dolly focuses in the diversity and inclusion world, but her thoughts clearly are show up in better, not perfect. They show up in complicit. If, if you take a look at the, the front of complicit, it's dedicated to six scholars who have heavily influenced me 
um, over time. And Dolly's one of those, one of those six. Um, but the other thing I do is, you know, I, I rely on others to make my arguments better and clearer. So, mm. um, I think that I probably spend more time being edited than most authors you <laughs> talk to. So I don't, I don't, I don't take pride in my sentence writing, but I have an editor by the name of uh, Katie Shank, who's a novelist, who's a spectacular writer, knows my literature. And so all of my recent books are thoroughly edited by Katie. My spouse, Marla Felcher, is a very good writer um, and very critical. So um, my writing is never quite good enough um, <laughs> by by her standards. So um, so I think that I, I I think that I am very talented in knowing when other people I know can do things better than I can do them. And when I read the newspaper in the morning, I'm constantly sort of reading through the lens of what does this tell me about the world that I need to pay attention to. So the answer to Dolly is, uh, Dolly, it's uh, you and lots of other people who <laughs> allow me to develop ideas and to uh, write them down in a way that hopefully other people will want to read them. Yeah, and Classic the lesson man. is make sure you get a good oh. editor, right? You get, get a really good editor. And, and, and Editors are so important, but so are doctoral students who know how to analyze data. And, yeah. and, and th there's so many other people who are kind of helpful to me in my work. Yeah. Max, one of the things you said just spurred a thought in my head. So um, I, I got my MBA at University of Iowa back in 1990 to 92, and I did have an ethics class. So we had an ethics class. It was taught by uh, the, an arbitrator, um, a lawyer, right? And, but uh, and, and he was the national, uh, the the baseball, the MLB, right? The major league baseball. He's the, he was the arbitrator for them. And so it was an interesting class because he'd bring in some of those stories of, you know, the thing. But when he taught it, it was more of a negotiations and kind of the legality that you have from a business perspective. And it always got to me that, all right, that's great, but is that ethics? And um, also this idea of trying to teach ethics is is something, particularly at an age where you are not formable in your, you know, younger years. It, is there a role that, you know, business schools need to play or school, general colleges in general, or maybe even going down to high school uh, to, to kind of build uh, an ethical framework into our society? Do you think that's something that needs to happen? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, um, so, uh, you know, we, there was an economist by the name of Milton Friedman that was very influential, and um, he presented his views as if they were a view, of, a philosophical view of the moral obligation of an individual, which was yeah. to maximize his or her own outcome. Yeah. And um, and and economists were far too quick to treat that as a reasonable philosophical view. And um, too many people taught their business students and public policy students that the moral obligation of the manager is to maximize shareholder profitability, which yeah. just doesn't happen to be the law. And so we end up sort of incorporating norms based on influential individuals. Um, I, I much prefer that I want to move toward a set of behaviors that create as much good and reduce as much harm as possible in the world. Now, I'm not a perfect individual, so I'm not going to get there. But I do think that I can be better in 2023 than I've been in 2022. And one pathway toward betterment is to be less complicit in allowing um, the unethical behavior of other people. I, I love that. I think it was Peter Yusinov that said, how can we get up every day and not have hope that today might be better than the day before? And I love the way that you frame this as this is like 2023 can be better, but I have to kind of wake up every morning and do it better. You know, I mean, you're I mean, you're all about personal responsibility in that regard. I think it's fantastic, Max. Thank you. Let's hope we all can become better. Yeah. So uh, we, we uh, you know, we always have to ask about what's on your playlist these days. What, what are you what are you listening to? Um, my recollection is last time we talked, uh, you had kind of a mix of jazz and classical. And I, I, I might be getting that wrong. Am, am I way off base on that? I, I don't remember what I said last time. That's, that's, that, that's, too, that's too, too hard of a question for me. But, but, but um, I'll do my best to give you a, a music answer. Again, I'm far from an expert in the music realm. But I just, in the process of 
writing complicit. I just constantly am coming back to the Bob Dylan song, Blowing in the Wind. Oh, wow. Because the information's out there. We can figure out what we need to do better, but we're just often not paying attention. So how many times? Must a cannonball fly before it's forever banned. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so and yeah, go you can cross all nine different verses there of of ways in which we ignore what we need to do. So so for me that's that, that's a, a song that I come back to over and over again as I do this kind of work. Max Bazerman, it is always a pleasure to have you as a guest to share time with you and to get your wisdom on these important issues. Thanks for being a guest on Behavior Groups today. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Max, have a free flowing conversation and talk about whatever else comes into our silent brains. Wow. Yeah. We are the ultimate omission makers, mm-hmm. aren't we? You know, it's just that uh, we stay silent when we should speak up. Yeah. 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 There was a, there was a Nike ad many, many years ago. Uh, and it was all, it was one of the just do it ones. And I forget who the athlete was, but they just had a bunch of these statements. And, um, you know, one of them is we, we stay silent when we should be shouting, you know, and I've, it's always one of those things that has stayed with me. Wow. And this idea that, yeah, too often we stay silent when we need to be shouting at the top of our lungs to say, stop take a look at this. This isn't right. We need to, we need to focus all of our energies, maybe not all of our energies, but we need to focus our energies on this and we're just letting it go. And, and we don't, we don't stop to examine that. And I think that's a big, that's a big piece of what Max is talking about here. Uh, that's well said. It's fantastic how vivid uh, a, a memory like that can be and how powerful it can be. So kudos to Nike for actually building a brand that's bigger than just performance and pleasure or something like that. You know, I mean, they they did a great job. OK, but let's we should we should definitely start this conversation around omission versus commission, because this is this is a big deal. This is really a big deal when I think that uh In our lives, in my life, I can absolutely think of times when I drove past a situation on the side of the road that looked like it could have been dicey, where I might have been able to help, but I wasn't sure. And so I kind of wrote it off as, well, I'm not really sure what was going on there, so I'm I'm just going to keep on driving. And and again, I think we get to this omission versus commission piece, right? This idea that, uh, all right, that the trolley you know, example, for those of you who don't know the trolley example, trolleys are like these train things, right? That's the British word. I love trolleys. Trolleys are, you know, it's like I'm watching, um, tank, what was Thomas the tank engine? Thomas the tank engine. Yeah, there you go. This idea, but this idea that, um, all right. So there's two different actions. I can take an action and it'll cause, you know, damage to my car or it would, you know, uh, the death of a somebody, right? And so I, if I choose when I'm actually making the, the thing to change the trolley coming down the track to, to damage my car instead of killing somebody, that's a, this is an act of commission. I did something to change it. Yep. However, if I take no action and the train, the tro- trolley comes down and it kills the person. Um, and my car gets unscathed because my car was over one lane and the person was stuck on the other one, then we, we look at that and we go, Oh, well, that was bad. That person died, but it's not the same as if I, that would have been reversed. And I moved the, I, I changed the, the train to go down and actually kill the person so it wouldn't damage my car. Right. Yeah. So when, if you throw the switch with uh, whatever direction the train is going and when you throw the switch, it's an act of commission. You're, you're doing something. So whatever way the train goes, you're actively participating in it. But if you just let the, the switch stand, whichever way it's going, then you, it, then it's an act of omission. And I think that this is really an important thing is that we tend to not frame a lot of our actions as omission. You know, we, we are 
quick to just say, well, that's, you know, to write something off. Oh, well, that's not my problem or no, no, that's some other department or, or, you know, that that's not my decision to make. When we have that gut feeling that says, wait a minute, this, this could be bad. We should, yeah. we should, we should do something about this or we should investigate or we should just ask the question. And when we don't do that, that omission can become complicit behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we need, as, as Max said, we need to hold ourselves and others to be much more responsible for errors of omission than, of than what we're doing. Yeah. Of, 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 we need to hold ourselves more responsible for errors of omission because right now we don't. We, we kind of, that's a, one of those things that we can let slide, right? We can, we can say, oh, that, that maybe. And, and part of the reason I think is, I, I don't necessarily know. I know the intent in the commission. You flip that switch. You've paid attention. You're making a decision that it is going, that that trolley is going to go towards that person or go towards that car because of the switch that I picked. Right. But omission, maybe you didn't notice the trolley. Maybe you, even though you're looking at it, maybe it didn't register in your head. Maybe. Maybe you're confused, right? Maybe you didn't understand the implications of what would happen. All of those different things. So intent becomes real salient when it's a act of commission for most things. But intent for omission is, yeah, I don't know. And so you can, that we, we, we give that a little bit of latitude that we probably shouldn't. Yeah, and that's that's Max's thesis, isn't it? That we ought not give omission the same kind. Of, we shouldn't give it any sort of lax. You brought up the heroic imagination project. Uh, yeah, Phil Zimbardo's work uh, when we were talking to Max. What made you connect to um, to Zimbardo's uh, project? I think what's really interesting is Max talking a lot about you know these these moments where we stay silent, where we should speak up. This idea that we aren't paying attention. And, and I think the heroic imagination is just saying, look, uh, heroism doesn't need to be this big, huge uh, jumping in front of a train to save people. It's, <laughs> right, the, it's right. the banal acts that we do every day that make everyday heroes. And, and the idea, you know, uh, Zimbardo came up with this because of the Stanford prison experiment where he saw these people kind of going down this, this, treadmill of of becoming more of um evil right this idea right. that that it was just we we kind of built upon that and we're allowing and, it and we're world. allowing it and as opposed to the opposite and he said if you know just one person himself included would have spoken up that would it could have changed the entire element of of what was going on there and what he looked at after that is why don't we have more of these acts of, of heroism? And in fact, we do. And the fact is that we can help train people to do that. So the heroic, um, imagination project, you know, they, they work with kids and different pieces to try to build that up. And one of the things that I love about this is that here, here are just some of the things of their teaching points that they have from their website. The, the, the first one that I, I love is this idea that the opposite of a hero is not a villain. It's a bystander. Yeah. The opposite yeah. of a hero is not a villain. It's a bystander. It's right. somebody who doesn't speak up. It's that what Max was saying in that the room like where they're doing the evaluations of this guy and he's getting all these great things and nobody's talking about that underlying current thing that wow, he's had a bunch of like sexual kind of, a you know, comments, you know, people have complained about him from, you know, being sexually, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, aggressive, aggressive, or, et cetera, yeah. different pieces of that. Right. And that I found to be kind of this, this really interesting thing. So understanding that, that, you know, a hero is the, the opposite isn't the villain. It's not necessarily the bad guy. Right. It's the, everybody else that's watching. The other piece that they talk about is, look, the bystander effect happens because no one wants to be the first person to act. This idea that you be the first person to speak up, you be that first person to point something out. And, and then if you decide to be the first person to act, that you'll often find that others join in and help you. This is right. Right. This is the piece. But we're scared that that won't happen. Yes. Yes. Right. And the other piece that they talk about in here is that even small actions can make a big difference. This idea of a small question asking somebody, well, 
you know, what have you heard about this person? Uh, you know, I've heard some rumors about him as, as not necessarily being all that good of a guy. That's a simple question to ask. And that simple act can make a big difference in how then everybody else can jump on the bandwagon and go, oh, now it's OK for me to talk about these things. But I wasn't I didn't want to be that first. So, yeah. Uh, I, I love that. By the way, if if listeners are wondering uh, when we talked to Phil Zimbardo, that was episode 247. I just want to call that out. Right. And a great example of when I think about an act of heroism as opposed to being a bystander was the, the young woman that videotaped George Floyd's murder. And it, I'm, it's still so visceral to me when I think about this. I think she was she's, you know, 16, 17 years old and she stands, you know, within arm distance, basically, of four police officers, you know, literally killing George Floyd, and she videotapes the whole thing. That was not a bystander. She was absolutely a hero in that moment for doing what she did for nine and a half minutes uh, to capture something that we today would not be uh, thinking about the same way if she had not captured that on video. On video. It's interesting because in some instances I go, yes, that that's not a bystander. And in others I go, could people have done more? There was a whole bunch of people around there. And yes, they, they were, were police, but could somebody have been more forceful? Could they have done something else? This wow. is one of those pieces where it's, it, is it an act of omission? Can, it, is me just standing by and maybe saying, Hey, stop that it, when maybe I should have done something and, and got the, you know, maybe I should have said you're actually killing him and gone up against the police. I, I don't know that yeah. that's one of those things. Again, we don't know what that outcome would have been. It could have ended in the exact same outcome with George Floyd dying and me just going to jail because I was doing I was trying to take an action to stop something that I felt was wrong. But we don't know. And that so, again, gets back to this omission commission piece is is really hard to know what is an omission versus what is a commission in, in some of these and taking that action. Yeah, yeah. And, and I go, and I'm sorry to keep going back to this heroic imagination project, but you know, part of what they're talking about is we need to become more comfortable in standing out. You know, we need to, we need to do little things. And so part of what they do is they tell people, you know, wear something outlandish in school. So people kind of might, you know, <laughs> look at that. They, they you know, right. do, say, sing a song in front of everybody at recess, do something that makes you stand <laughs> out. So it doesn't become like this thing that all of a sudden it's the first time that you're standing out, right. that you become familiar with that. Pay attention to what other people are feeling. Understand this is an important piece, I think, on, on what uh, Max is saying too, is that we go through our lives kind of in our own he head in our own kind of thing. And we know the intent that we're wanting to, uh, to, to have happen, but that intent doesn't necessarily convey into how other people uh, are impacted by this. And so we have to pay attention right to that. And I think those are two really big things. I want to make sure that we cover the importance of context in this. When I think about the corporate world, when I think about organizations, even family and, and relationships, sort of what are the systems that we have in place to basically support uh, someone who is going to be able to stand up and raise their hand and say, wait a minute, I don't think that this is working the way that we thought it was going to work. Or, or you know, I heard someone make a comment that, that, that may or may not be what they meant, but what I heard was this, and I think that we need to be aware of that. And, and some of that context is psychological safety, uh, yeah. you know, to create an environment where people have the ability to speak up and raise their hand and say, I'm not sure if we're, we're all cool with this, you know. Um, now, going back to David Robson and the expectation effect and the, the impact that leaders can have, you know, leaders play an important role in this, this idea that the the psychological safety that you talk about but the expectations that they set about all of this mm -hmm. you know the company culture that you create can either be one that is one that stay silent or one that speaks up can i just give a shout out to max uh, because every time we are in a discussion with another guest and we bring up max bazerman's name there's like this reverence that happens yeah. and it's pretty fantastic that we get to talk to some of the most 
amazing people on the planet. And I, I just think that Max brings this light to the world that I, you said that you said it in the introduction, Kurt. It's not just the light that he brings to the world to shine on these important things. He brings it to himself. Yeah. So he is the classic example of the guy who isn't um, he's not saying just do what I do, do what I say, not what I do. He's doing it. He's applying this to himself. And I'm just want to give a big shout out to Max and um, and say thanks to him for, for being who he is. Yeah. Well, Tim, I'm pretty sure we could spend hours talking about Max <laughs> and about this book, but I'm thinking we probably should wrap this up. What do you think? OK, agreed. Um, so we've mentioned this a couple of times. Uh, but I just want to reiterate that our world is a better place because of Max Bazerman. That's true. That I just can, I just had true, to say true, that true, one more true. time. Yeah. Yeah. His openness and ability to talk about his own complicity uh, comes through so naturally that that's the interesting part. Right. It's that natural yeah. element where it's painful for him. You can tell, but he does it. It's It's a natural thing. And that makes him something like a spokesperson for being able to talk about being complicit. Yeah. And Groovers, we need to mention something that was complicit in the rise of behavioral grooves through the ranks of the social science podcast world, Apple Podcasts, right? Um, yeah. Almost, yeah. right, 50%, I believe, uh, of, all of, of our, our listeners. Of, of all yeah. of our listeners are, are on Apple. So, so thanks, Apple, for being there as an access point uh, for us when we were just getting started and even today. We also want to thank Apple Podcasts for being the primary listening tool for all these thousands and thousands of listeners around the world. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's kind of cool that they created this system that allows our conversations to to get out into the world. So, and, th you know, thank you. Granted, Apple. whatever you listen on, we appreciate it. Um, yeah. And so but with that, we hope you take a bit of humility and clear eyed thinking from our discussion with Max. And you use this this week to go out and find your groove.